I said it in a previous video, but I have a lot of random itch.io games. Like, a lot. There are a lot of Game Jolt games and free Steam games as well. So, what better way to experience them all than doing a bunch of them at a time and chucking them straight at you? If any of these games interest you, the links will be below and I urge you to check some of them out. So, let's just get straight into it. The first game I'd like to look at today is actually a suggestion from its own developer, who asked for my input on it. I hope you don't regret that decision. The developer is named MaxJK0, and has made quite a few different games, but the one he recommended is Away in Graphical Limbo. They suggested this game on the Force Real Games video hoping I'd like it. Well, I did. Yeah, there's an asterisk there for a reason, but we'll get to that. This game poses itself as a surreal game in an odd world, and anyone who's been on the channel for a while knows how much of a sucker I am for style and surrealness. Now looking at this game, it has a very vibrant color scheme and some cracks, but just in this little beginning area, the colors and odd TVs contrast in a way that makes it beautiful in an unconventional way, with the TV static sky. Then we head into this one TV with a field in it. Now this introduces us to one of the game's few features, transport minigames. I have a love-hate relationship with this mechanic, and I just like to say it now, developer, please watch all the way through this section if you're watching. Anyway, this minigame is so cool. If you choose the advanced control options before starting up, you can do a bunch of weird movement, and your camera isn't locked to a degree rotation it can go. So you can do barrel rolls and mid-air backflips. Very cool. Unless you have motion sickness, in which case, maybe not as cool for you. But in getting all these stars while flying through this little space, we go through this eyeball, which brings us to this giant low poly field. Mm, I'll save my comments for this till the end. In this field, there are three buildings you can choose to go through. You can also grab this file from the mouse icon. Going to this little building, we can do that flying minigame we just did before, where we collect stars in this animated Microsoft Windows screensaver. Passing through, we end up in this weird... Yeah, I don't even know. There's a guy who lost his wine in a Mission Impossible laser room and tanks and police cars and then some newsroom? The guy in the newsroom is some crackpot conspiracy theorist about cameras and I just spiritually connect to this guy. You can also walk into this random dark backspace and enter this pig trough? In doing so, we pass into this flying through minigame where we can now look at weird animated sets of 4D objects. And eventually going through, you can get into this rave area with a bar. Some partiers and a drunk woman in the cellar, and there's also a bartender, too. There's another connection in here, but I will mention it later. Going into this big house back in the grassy area, we go through this flying minigame in a fish tank. After that, we end up in this pretty neighborhood area with a bunch of odd characters and interactions. Mm, I gotta make comments later. Okay, who am I kidding? Before I go into my criticism, there's also areas like this nice little town that connects to the bar, and weird backrooms area, and this one area with a hat man in it. So, let's get to my complaints. So I know the developer wanted me to look at this game and see if I enjoyed it. And I did, with an asterisk. I think this game seriously has a load of potential in it, but it needs to be improved. If the developer is still watching, please at least consider my criticism, as I don't say this to be mean or insult your work, I want it to reach its fullest potential. So here's my advice. Cut the flying portions. Kinda. I really like the idea of these flying puzzle minigames, allowing you to transport to different areas. My main problem with it is how they are 1. slow, and 2. you have to do them every single time you pass into an area. This means whether you're going in or out, you have to do it both times, and this mixture makes them go from a neat idea to an incredibly annoying mechanic. Anytime I go through a door or new area, I have to go through this minigame that feels super slow and takes upwards of 30 seconds. It doesn't sound like a lot, and that sounds nitpicky, but this minigame feels slow, especially compared to the small maps that they transport the player to. It just loses its fun after a very short amount of time. Looking at my Surreal Game video, there was this one game that had a concept similar to this, but it was just a flash walking into an object, and there you were. Like I said, I really like the concept of needing to make this flight path and going to new areas, and I love how most of these minigame rooms look with their unique style. But what I feel like it needs to be is a one-time thing per door. Just one-time travel. I like the idea of the mechanic, but I don't like its execution. There's also the inventory and talking system. There's no controls option or text bubble that tells me I have an inventory or that P is options by default. Just saying. That was a bit frustrating and made the game a bit frustrating to play through for me. 
The only reason I realized that there was an inventory is because it had appeared on the web version when I was mashing random keys. I played both the download and web versions, and I didn't record much of the web version, but I assure you, there's a hat man in this game, which I found funny. Now I hate that I started that with the big negatives of this game, but if that wasn't an issue, I really think that this would be a nice experience. I really like the art style and environments, they're cute. My only issue with the graphics is just how many gaps there are between every surface and how my camera clipped through almost every single wall. Those are really my only criticism and suggestions on the game. But I think it's a nice base and nice idea. Personally, I think even if just the minigame thing was fixed, then it would be much more enjoyable and easy for people to explore the game. So, do I recommend this game? Even with all its issues? Yeah. I think that this game has a lot of potential if these visual bugs and my own little personal issue with it got fixed. And I know people already have given this game good reviews on Itch.io, but this is just my personal criticism. Now, onto the much creepier game, Corpse Ocean. Corpse Ocean is a game on Itch.io capitalizing on how terrified I am of the ocean. The word thalassophobia means fear of the deep ocean. This game perfectly exemplifies that in one of the best ways possible. The game starts with a message. On August 9th, 1989, an experimental Navy sub went missing in the Sargasso Sea. Three weeks later, it was reportedly found by divers from Puerto Rico. The sub is carrying an identified organic material that must be retrieved. That's where we come in. We're a submarine pilot and have access to some neat little tools. In this submarine, we can go in every direction and have a scanner, sonar, screen for, for objectives, and our dog pictures. Can't forget those. So, our goal is to find six of the barrels that have organic materials. We need to use this compass to explore the ocean's depths and find the barrels. Using the sonar, we can pick up where the barrels are, and using our scanner, we can send them up to be recaptured. Rinse and repeat. I like this area. There's little schools of fish, a nice little sandy area. Oh, uh, we need to go a bit farther out? Okay, okay, it shouldn't be too bad. I don't like how dark it's getting. I do like the barrels next to the broken submarine. That area's pretty nice. I quite like it. Wait, what are all those blips on my sonar? After clearing these barrels that are really deep in the ocean, we can finally go to the last barrel. Wait, where the hell is that barrel? All that's here is some stupid ancient temple that houses an ancient god. Damn it. Okay, well that was a cool design at least. And I really like this game. The sonar mechanic and the one skeleton jump scare had me on edge the whole time. The broken submarine had me thinking there was something lurking and always going to attack me. It created a really cool aspect of suspense and horror that made me worried the entire time that something was just going to attack the side of my sub. The graphics were great, the horror was on point, my thalassophobia was triggering, it was cool. The next game is another short experience, The Ghost of Channel 6. This one is the shortest of all the games, and had an interesting story but a little bit of lackluster gameplay. The game has your character in their apartment with the computer open with this written down. In 1999, there was a series of reports from viewers of Channel 6 about an image of a woman flashing randomly on normal broadcasting. It was later discovered that the woman in the images was Mia Buxton, one of the many victims of now-convicted serial killer Paul Terran. Channel 6 never officially acknowledged the incident. However, a number of people started to come up with rituals and games to summon Mia Buxton. The most common game goes as follows. The website then details the process where the player will need to light a candle in front of the TV, get a piece of paper, spill their blood on it, turn all the lights off, and turn the TV on. During this time, four marbles will spawn in their house and they need to find them. Something that frustrated me the first time I played this was how it was too dark to see anything. I hadn't noticed there was a flashlight button, which, honestly, my fault. The game itself is super easy. A marble in the kitchen, on this table, on this nightstand, and on the bathroom. Then, you go to sleep. Once you fall asleep successfully, you can get a new ghost visitor. Yep, that's, uh, that's it, man. Well, if you fail, you get this incredibly loud jump scare. This game is pretty simple, and a neat experience, but not particularly unique, and doesn't stand out too much. One thing I'd like to say is that this game seems to be a reference to a real event of the creepy missing Joanna Lopez event. Blame It On Jorge has an amazing video on the subject, but Joanna Lopez's missing poster, who no one seems to know, appeared at the end of a local news broadcast after it had signed off, seemingly being hijacked. Pretty neat, very creepy, and I want to move on from this. Our next, and actually longest game, is Covert Critters. This is the longest game in comparison to the others. It was one I was tempted to make a video on for its own, 
but I just kind of want to include it here. So in this game, you play as Koss, the Gecko, a spy. Our mission objective is to liberate the Gecko facility, which has been overrun by a group known as the Red Hawks, who terrorize the Gecko population. Our mission is to stop them from grabbing nuclear weapons and kick them out silently. This game is so cool. There's eight missions that take you through the game, carrying unique style and really cool gameplay. There's a variety of environments and mechanics. It's just such a cool little stealth game. The tutorial level shows us how to use key cards and the method of sneak. Camo. As a gecko, we can camouflage ourselves on walls to hide from guards and cameras. It's a pretty simple concept with an easy clear, but some of the mechanics do take a while to get used to, like how the camo works while moving on walls. The next stage is more so a tutorial on how to deal with enemies and sneak past them. It also teaches you how to take key cards off of guards and how to use your minimap to your advantage. The next stage is an area where we lose this amazing minimap's abilities and are on a different, less welcoming environment. It's much darker and an interesting challenge. You can actually learn how to use most of the items in this game, like the night vision drone, which will be very helpful later. Completing that stage, we can end up in this frozen warehouse section and, oh, it's just such a neat environment, especially contrasting the previous ones. The next one is closer to a drab office style. But the design and geometry is interesting, and even with how wide some of the corridors feel, it sometimes felt like a tight fit because of all the guards and diagonal walls. There's also a darker portion of this level where it's much harder to see and you lose your minimap again. These sections are just so cool and make you reconsider every action and use your tools to your advantage. Just so cool. The next stage is an office area similar to the last, but in a very different style. My best analogy to its style is a grand bank or law firm or some type. For some reason, the bank office from the first Despicable Me movie comes to my mind when looking at the style. That and, like, the first world bank from Payday 2. The last stage is the nuclear facility itself, and this section was quite a bit harder than the last ones, but it's still a great stage. As much as it did anger me with all my failed attempts and over 25 minutes failing at it, every death felt fair and like it was my own fault. This last stage mixes almost every single mechanic and idea from all the previous levels and makes it perfectly balanced in a way where I felt frustrated when I lost, but never really at the game. In getting past all the enemies and obstacles thrown your way, you can finally prevent the launch of the nuclear missiles. If you don't want spoilers for the ending, I recommend you fast forward to this timestamp if you want to play the game for yourself. But oh, who am I kidding? None of you care. We get a call from command and they congratulate us on our work, but their wording is fishy. Then they drop the act. How easy it was to manipulate costs into coming into this facility. The reason the mission was so easy is because they wanted Koss to deactivate the launch. Why? They needed his Gecko ID to launch a bigger attack and destroy Gecko Land as we learn that the ones coaxing us on this path was actually the Red Hawks. That was such an interesting twist ending. That game was incredible. It was just a free demo made by two developers over a 12-day period for a game jam according to their Itch.io page. And honestly, the quality and passion of this game, which is just a demo by the way, blew me away. It has incredible graphics, a great story, great and well-rounded mechanics, very fitting ambience and music, quality level design, and a lot of great ideas in general. This game, I recommend for anybody who loves retro stealth games, or just want to try it. I'll be the first to say that I'm not a huge fan of action stealth games and roguelikes. This may not be a roguelike, but I think the game made me want to try more stealth games just because of how good of a game it was. I now genuinely want to eventually make a video checking out the rest of this developer's games, because the developers, Soda Raptor, have multiple other games and demos in their portfolio. These developers are clearly super talented, as I can see that they have an impressive Metroidvania first-person shooter and top-down shooters. They even have a game that is inspired by LSD Dream Emulator. I'll have to check that one out at some point. I might just do a full video on these developers at some point with how cool their games look. Or maybe just the LSD Dream Emulator one, I don't know yet. If you'd like to see that, then comment below. Anyway, I've given these guys so much praise. I need to move on to the next game, which conveniently is recommended on their Itch.io page. Our last game is another Thalassophobia Nightmare, Frontier Diver. In this game, you play underwater and have a sonar ability to judge how far things are. This is another smaller game to round it all out, and we can discover these cool underwater buildings. This area is just so cool looking into this giant crater-like area. We can see other buildings with odd architecture, and there's even one that has divots in between the levels. It just looks kind of nice. 
Going down the last crater, there's a hole that goes down super far, going down past 2,000 meters. We can see the weird fleshy mass that looks incredibly deformed and in agony. Trying to go back up leads to this little cutscene. It's not the most impressive, but it's nice. I don't think it does suspense as well as Corpse Ocean, but I think its concept is quite interesting. It's a really short game, and I think I finished it in under like 10 minutes. But the atmosphere is interesting, but it is a bit plain. Although, looking at the itch page, it was understandable considering that it was made for a weekend game jam. Once again, I'd like to mention the developers of this game. Modus Interactive. Another itch developer that I also have some other games from, like Neko Yumi. Their games seem to be more atmospheric than gameplay oriented, which is perfectly fine. One of my favorite games of all time was Yume Niki, and they even have a game called Neko Yumi. Something I just learned is that this kind of translates to cat dream, while Yume Niki means dream journal. How did I never learn that? Well, I learn something new every day. I know this has been a weird tangent, but I more or less enjoyed most of the games today. Some of them I think need work, but show potential. There were some really simple games, and some others that come from experienced developers with some impressive catalogs. All of these games display a range of games that come onto Itch.io, and I'm glad I could share them all with you. I hope I introduced you to some cool new games and developers, and even took more note of developers I've already seen before. This video has made me really want to explore developers like Soda Raptor, Modus Interactive, and more. I also learned that Kira, the developer of Corpse Ocean, also created the Basilisk game, which Sagan Hawks has done an amazing cover of. Wait, it's Hawks and not Hawkins? Oh, sh- Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed this video. As always, comments, criticism, and suggestions are always welcome and appreciated. It's been me, Moosh. I'll see you later. Adi Vidarji.